in 3 John, and we've been having this theme this month of health, but spiritual health and mental health and physical health, there's many aspects of it. I've reminded you that you know we have three parts, body, soul, and spirit. And I want to talk today about a healthy spirit. I want to talk about praying for other people. We live in a time where it is very dark and negative and depressing and there's nothing good on the news. You look at the focus of television shows and it's horrible content. It's just horrible, degrading, demeaning, demonic content that Satan is trying to infiltrate the the minds of believers and discourage us and get us to forsake the Word. We live in a time where now more than ever, we see that there is a lack of joy in most people in the world. Now listen, we as Christians, we have true joy. He says, no man will take your joy. It says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And God gives you such joy in salvation that really nothing should ever get you down. We, as David did, we can encourage ourselves in the Lord our God when we recognize that we need to thank Him for the free gift of salvation. He's given to us of His Holy Spirit to help us to live. And He calls that Spirit the Spirit of Truth. Our theme for the whole year has been truth in every aspect of it. And this month, it's about the truth in our health. And it's important that we would diagnose ourselves sometimes and look in the mirror and just say, what's going on? What do I need to fix? Every one of you at some point looks in a mirror and says, what do I need to do? Right? Well, maybe not Brother Eric. He's got a long beard. I'm just kidding. I'm picking on Brother Eric. Well, but we ought to. We need to look in the mirror, which is the Bible. It's the law of liberty. We look into it so we know what we need to do. Well, God's given us of His Word so that we can have joy. And I'm just fascinated as I read this passage at the joy, at the joy that John has. Now, this possibly was written from prison. John didn't end his life in a mansion with millions of dollars. He gave it all to serve God. And he had true joy. And I'm, I'm just amazed at his love for other people. How much he cared for other people. How much he prayed for other people. And he invested in them and he poured in them. And the truth that I want to pull out of this passage today is the joy of discipleship. The joy of discipleship. Because, listen, there's no greater joy than to be able to teach somebody the right thing and it helps them and God blesses them. That's the truth we're going to see right here with John. If we'll look at verse number 1, it says, The elder unto the well-beloved. There it is, that love. Gaius, whom I love in the truth. We use that phrase, I I love you like a brother in Christ, as sisters and brothers. We're a family of God. We ought to have that family love. Verse 2, he says, Beloved, there it is again, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. One of his major desires for this man was that he would prosper. I mean, he's thinking about him. He's praying for him. He's wishing him good things. He's encouraging him. Just think about what John is doing with this guy. He's staying in touch with this person to encourage him, and he's doing it remotely. And his wish above all things is that he would prosper and be in health. Apparently, this man had something wrong with his health. And when you have problems with your health, you know what it'll do? It'll discourage your spirit. And I want you to think about the spiritual truth that's in this, that sometimes we get discouraged and we don't have joy. And listen, there's joy in discipleship. Uh, my, My sermon isn't anything amazing or super profound. It's a simple concept. If you have problems with joy in your life, then you can fix it by discipling someone else. Now, oftentimes we think of discipleship as in, I'm the teacher and teaching them. But many times in the Bible, it was two people coming alongside of each other that were equals in God's eyes or peers. And they were carrying that burden together and carrying the cross together. They were working together for God's glory. Many families, that's what they need. They need 
to rejoice in the ability to disciple one another and encourage each other in the Lord. God has a plan here and we see it being worked out through John where he's praying that this man would prosper and be in health. Look at verse 3. He says, For I rejoiced greatly. What a statement. When's the last time you rejoiced greatly for something? Just now. Just think in human nature, isn't it normally like, woohoo, I got a bonus this week, man. I got some extra money. Hey, I got my taxes. The Jags just scored. Ah, woo! Right? I mean, don't we rejoice for a lot of fleshly, selfish things? Man, I went to lunch the other day and we went to this fancy restaurant and I thought it was going to be a lot of money and they gave me one of the lunches for free. Amen. When's the last time we rejoiced about somebody else's growth? I want you to think what he's saying here. He loves this guy so much. His greatest wish is that he would grow in the Lord and have a good spirit and that he would prosper in his health and his life, his finances, right? Think about it. And then he says, look at it. He says in verse 3, For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. He says, man, I was so happy when I found out that not only did you get saved and that you were prospering in your spirit, but then you were walking in the truth. Because listen, once you have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit wants to lead you and guide you into all truth. He is the Spirit of truth. He's inside of you to help you. The, the problem is usually we want to walk in our own way. We want to do it our own way. We want to prefer ourselves. John here loved this man so much. He wanted to see him grow. And when he heard that he was growing in the Lord, that the discipleship was working, he had true joy. You understand that at the end of John's life, he was afflicted and imprisoned, but yet he took joy in hearing that others were walking with the Lord. I want you to think about how powerful of a blessing that is. Do you rejoice when others grow in the Lord? Look at the next verse. Verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. What a statement. I, get, I, I take joy in nothing else in this world greater than when I hear that a believer is growing in the Lord. Amen. Isn't that an amazing thing? And I've seen people over the years where they come, you know, years ago we used to have Bible studies in another city and these, some of these young men, they would get on fire for the Lord and they'd start reading their Bible for themselves and then they would come to me with these verses like, hey man, check this out. Did you know this? And look at this verse and look what it's teaching. And man, I was excited for them because of their understanding of God's Word because that's their own knowledge now. They had attained to a level where they were reading the Bible from themselves. The Holy Spirit was working inside of them. Now listen, there is joy in discipleship and if you, if you are ever down and depressed and worried and overwhelmed and discouraged, there's joy in discipleship. There's joy in discipleship. Who are you helping? Who are you serving? Who are you praying for? If you're walking in the flesh and you're mad, it's, <laughs> that means you're probably not praying for somebody else's needs, are you? You don't take joy in them growing in the truth of the Lord. If you would go, to, go back to uh, 2 John, you're in 3 John, go back to 2 John. I warn you, we live in a time, uh, in the end times it says that, the, uh, that uh, because of iniquity will abound, that the love of many will wax cold. People will just not care for each other. They're going to be heartless. There's no joy in the world. There's no true satisfaction in doing it the world's way. You'll never be satisfied that way. People are lost and dying and on their way to hell and they have no true happiness. They have no true joy. And yet God has given you a gift. He's given you the gift of salvation, which means all your sins are forgiven. And then he's kind of put the cherry on the cake and he gave you the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit so that we can share God's love with others. And you think about the love that he had for this man. In 2 John chapter 1, look at verse 1. 
the elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth. There it is again. And not only I, but also all they that have known the truth. He says, I'm not the only one that loves you. There's other people you've never met. They've heard about what you're doing over there in that city. And they're encouraged for you. And they love you. And they're praying for you. Verse 2, for the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. That's the spirit of truth. That's the Holy Spirit he's talking about. That truth is in you forever. If you believe that Jesus is God and He died for your sins, no one can convince you otherwise. I could hold you down and twist your arm. or you know, I couldn't change it. It's kind of like if I tried to convince you that the sun is not real and it doesn't rise. You'd have to be out of your mind to be able to say something like that, wouldn't you? Once you understand the truth and you've experienced the truth and that truth is in us and it says, and He, he is with us forever. That's the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit. Well, why does He give us the Holy Spirit? So that we can have this kind of love that John has. When John was in a horrible pit, he's in a prison in a horrible situation and he's worried about other people. Can you imagine being in prison and you're concerned about somebody else's health? Praying for the well-being of somebody. Can you imagine getting a letter from prison? Hey, how's your finances doing? How's your health? I'm praying for you. I heard that you're growing in the Lord. That excites me and I rejoice in it and it encourages me. and it, Boy, it gives me the strength to keep on going. John was so close to the Lord and he understood the love of Christ so much. You know what John said, how he referred to himself in, in the apostle, in, in his book, John, he called himself the disciple that Jesus loved. Now, he didn't say it in an exclusive way, like he loved me the best. He didn't say it like I'm the only one he loved. But he was so close and he saw the love that he didn't deserve. It made such an impact on his life that that's all he could. You know how he bragged on himself? By the love of Jesus. You know what he named himself? the one that Jesus loved. What an interesting statement because now John is writing to other people about love, about discipleship through love and how to grow in love. Look at verse 3. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in truth and love. Now look at it, verse 4. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. What an interesting statement. Now John is saying, hey, I heard you got people saved and now they're growing in the Word and you're discipling them. I was encouraged by that. Do you understand that that was like giving vitality to this man that was in prison? To hear that people were growing in the Lord? Now guys, I give you this because I want to encourage you in a time when love is waxing cold, I want you to find contentment I want you to find joy in discipleship. I want you to be somebody that focuses on helping others grow in the Word. That's your calling. That's what God has called you to do, just as He did the 12. Look, He says in verse 5, And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning that we love one another. He says, hey, this isn't nothing new. What is Christian discipleship? Love your brother. Yeah, yeah, that's the old commandment. I know, this is Christianity 101. If you can't even love your brother that you have seen, how can you say you love God? We're called to love. He says in verse 6, and this is love, that we walk after His commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. You know what God wants you to do? Obey Him. It's real simple. Now, do I have to obey Him to go to heaven? No, nope. all I have to do is trust in Jesus and receive the gift of eternal salvation. Then what? Well, now that you're saved, He gives you the Holy Spirit. He, he makes it so you can do supernatural things. You can do spiritual things. And His desire for you is that you would keep His commandments. He doesn't want us to be hypocrites. Go back a few pages to 1 John chapter 2. Go back to 1 John chapter 2. He says this same thing about the no new commandment. When you get there, go to verse number 7. 
Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. So here he says, yeah, that's the old one, but and I'm going to give you a new one. Just as Jesus often did, he took things to another level. He didn't just leave it as it was. He gave more clarity on the law and the intention of the law. In verse 9 it says, He that saith he is in light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We're going to spend eternity with one another, and the devil wants to get in between your relationships. The devil wants you to hate your brother or sister in Christ. Is that my car? Are you doing that? <laughs> he tells us, again, look, at, look with me in verse number 9. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. Not everybody's going to push their button. <laughs> Let's see if we can get them in unison. All right, who drives a big blue van? Well, somebody's in big trouble. <laughs> now, now, sisters, don't, don't get angry at your sister. Don't blame your sister. You're both guilty. All right. <laughs> Let's get back to the Word of God here. Okay. John is trying to instruct them that we have a problem with love. We don't love when we should, and we love ourselves. And by loving ourselves, we end up hating our brother. Our brothers and sisters in Christ oftentimes are different than us. Somebody was asking me this question yesterday. You know, well, well, what about those people? I mean, are, 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 they, are they saved? And it's like, well, now salvation is simple. That's the doctrine of salvation is maybe 5 or 10% of all the doctrine that you have. Is it possible you can get saved and somebody can teach you bad doctrine and you're in bad doctrine at the time, but you're still saved? Well, yes. So what do you do? Well, you hate them and... You'd let them know you hate. No, no, no. You love them and you tell them the truth and you try to guide them back to the scriptural truth and get them out of the error in doctrine that comes from man-made doctrines. Look, he says in verse 10, He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. What he's trying to warn us of is when we're angry with somebody and we hate somebody, we're walking around in a dark room and we're going to trip and hurt ourselves and we don't even see that it's our fault. It's because we've decided to hate somebody. We've decided to be angry. We want to pick a fight. And God says, you are in darkness and it's your fault. Now, we as Christians, we have the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome we have the ability to love even when it's not easy. That's why God's given us the Holy Spirit. If you would, go to Hebrews chapter 10. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. In fact, one of the biggest components of discipleship is encouragement. Uh, there's joy in discipleship when you do it right. Uh, we often think, again, that it's an instructor down at a pier, but there are many people at different levels. And I really believe that we can all learn from one another. I am a firm believer that I can learn from anyone in here and that any one of you in here can learn from somebody else. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. If you read the Scriptures, there are things that we can learn from each other, even when it's an unspoken thing. Just seeing how somebody responds in a situation, sometimes you say, man, that's godly. That's the Holy Spirit at work. That's meekness and love. In Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse number 23. 
Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. I love this phrase, consider one another. That means think about other people. Provoke. Now that means to challenge. When you think of the word provoke, I mean, the, the, the image that I get is somebody putting their fingers in somebody else's chest and provoking them to a fight. Hey, buddy, listen here, right? Well, here he's saying, no, wait a minute. Consider somebody else and challenge them unto love and good works. As believers in Christ, together, we're here to lift each other up. You either pull somebody up or you pull them down. You can only do one of the two things. And the question is, what are you doing right now? Are you pulling somebody down? Or are you lifting somebody up? Are you trying to help them get closer to the Lord? So he says, provoke them unto love and to good works. And he, and he tells us how. Look at verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. So he says, don't forsake church. When we assemble, we're the congregation. That's what church is. And he says, don't reject church and stop going to church when you're having a problem. No, because God wants you to consider others to provoke them. And then he says to exhort them. You know, sometimes when you go to church, it's not just for you. Sometimes God wants to use you to be a blessing to somebody else. There's somebody else that you can help, that you can put a smile on, that you can encourage them and God wants you to go to help them. I mean, God, that's how God works in a body where different parts of the body work together to help each other. And he says, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Do you guys not see the day approaching? Isn't this world just getting weirder and weirder and more wicked? And people don't have any joy. They don't have any true love. They don't want to hear the name of Jesus. I mean, we live in a strange and a very dark time. And you know what we need? To encourage each other. To exhort, that means to motivate. I'm here to challenge you and encourage you and motivate you. God loves you and he wants to use you. And I really believe that every person in, this, in here has a ministry. God wants to use you to minister to other people. God's given you the power of the Holy Spirit. He's given you the completed Holy Scriptures. You have all of his word. You have everything that you need. I was talking with somebody recently, and, well, well, how many times do you guys have preaching at the church? I said, well, let's see, we do Sunday school, then the preaching hour, then we have evening service on Sunday, well, then we have Wednesday night Bible study. Man, that's four times a week. We have preaching four times a week. And the, the reaction, I don't know how many times, I mean, now think about it. How many, how many of you go to the gym four times a week? Don't raise your hand. How, oh, he's busted. All right, you're in trouble. How many of you watch a TV show four times a week? Don't raise your hand. How many of you read a newspaper four times a week? I, I want you to think about something because we live in an age where you're defined by what you do. Now, I don't want to box you in. If I came to you and I said, hey, man, what do you do? And you say, well, I'm a framer. I frame houses. Well, you're so much more than that. You're more than just a guy with a hammer and a board and some nails. You're more than that. You're greater than that, right? But if that's how, what you do the majority of your time defines who you are. What do you do several times a week? Do you run around the block? If somebody says, if somebody sat down with you for the first time and they said, tell me about yourself, you would say, I'm a runner. A runner? Yeah, I run every day. Really? Or you say, I'm a historian. I'm an avid reader. I can tell you about different things in history. And I want you to think about the context of this verse. We're called to build each other up. We're called to exhort one another. Earlier we saw that he had no greater joy than his children walk in truth. And I want you to think about this. You know, your children are going to do what you do. And if what you're doing the majority of the time is not something that the Lord is pleased with, well, they're going to follow you in that. And I know we all have a lot of hobbies. Well, I ride a motorcycle. I ride a dirt bike. I ride a four-wheeler. I go shooting. I'm a hunter. Tell me about yourself. Who are you? Oh, let me tell you what I like. Do you want your children to be known as Christians? Well, then I would encourage you to open the Bible with them more than once a week. Do you want to be known as a Christian? Well, then I, I would encourage you to open the Bible several times a week. 
We have church multiple times in the week. And I'm not picking on anybody that doesn't make it to all the services. I know we have folks that come from a long distance. And there are some that come faithfully from a long distance. I understand my work schedule might be different than yours. We all have a different uh, life, if you will. But what are you known? What's your reputation? What do you do? Well, I'm a, I'm a technician. I'm a mechanic. I'm a plumber. I'm an electrician. Ought not we to say, I'm a Christian? Now I want you to think about this because we're talking about the joy of discipleship and I have no greater joy than to see that we're all getting closer to God. We're getting deeper in the Word. We're getting more like Him. As John walked with Christ, he learned who Jesus was. He understood the will of God and the love of God. That was taught to him and then he wanted to teach somebody else. We're called, as he says, to go and do that likewise. We need to do the same thing that Jesus did. That's our purpose on this earth. If you would, go to John chapter 13. Go to John chapter 13. What do you do several times a week? Are you studying the Word of God? Are you praying for other people that they would grow? Are you serving others by love? Serve one another. In John chapter 13, look at this. In, in verse number 1, he says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that His hour was come, that He should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved His own which were in the world, He loved them unto the end. This love that Jesus had for His twelve was so great. John was one of the twelve. We just read one of the last things that he wrote. And you know what? He's like, my time is up. I'm going to depart. And I want to give you some final things. You need to love. You need to help others. You need to grow. You need to walk in the truth. He, he's, he, John did the same thing that Jesus did. He gave him a list of some final things. And love was at the top of the list. Look at verse number 13. You call me Master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done unto you. Jesus said, I was the example, do what I did. Now, the, the night that he was betrayed, he washed Judas's feet. He got down on the ground, he kneeled down, he held his dirty, stinky feet, and he cleaned them up, trying to show that he was paying for the sins. Verse 16, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. I'm talking about how to have joy, how to rejoice is John. John's at the end of his life. He's in a miserable situation physically. He's got a hundred reasons to complain, but he's not. He's saying, I hope you're doing well. I'm praying for your prosperity and health. Hey man, I am rejoicing when I hear that you're growing in the Lord. And here he gets it from Jesus who did the same thing. My time is up. I'm about to die. It's going to hurt. If you do what I'm doing, love one another, you'll be a happy person. You know why this world is not a happy place? They don't have the love of Jesus. It's actually super simple. Look at verse 23. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom he loved. Who's that? That's John. He didn't even name himself. He didn't call himself St. John the Divine. That's a title that other people gave to him. He called it the revelation of Jesus Christ. He didn't give him some, some big lofty title. Oh, I'm up here. No, hey, I'm, like, I'm a servant. I'm just like Jesus, and I'm going to serve in love just like Jesus did. Jesus gave us the example. Look at verse 33. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go ye cannot come. So now I say unto you, a new commandment I give unto you. You hear this language? Little children, new commandment. What John was giving us was not new to John. It came straight from Jesus. 
A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Whenever there's a breakdown in Christian relationships, and there's anger and frustration and hatred, contention and strife, it's because we've stopped following Jesus. Jesus was quick to forgive. He loved the unlovable. He loved those that hated Him. He forgave those that put Him to death. And He did it for our sake so that we could be saved. Jesus, although He was the son of a carpenter, He wasn't known as a carpenter. He was known as a prophet. What are you known as? Are you known as a loving Christian or something else? You understand, we have the ability to sort of write our own history. If you would go to John 15. Go to John chapter 15. Look at verse number 11. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. If you're lacking in joy this morning, I'm going to tell you why. Look at the next verse. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Now, this is the Christian life summed up. You know what? If, if you're lacking joy, if your joy is not full, if it's diminished, if you're just not satisfied with life, it's because you've lost the love for the Lord or you've lost the love for your brother and sister in Christ. This is my commandment, that you love one another. Why? So that your joy may be full. God wants you to be able to rejoice as John did. Yeah, but, uh, you know, I mean, think about it. He's in a prison. He's dying. The food he ate was miserable there. His body was falling apart. He's losing his eyes. Things were not going well for him. He knew that he wasn't going to get out of that prison. And he's writing to somebody just telling them, I love you, beloved. I'm rejoicing. Oh, man, great is my joy when I hear what you're doing for the Lord. There's true joy in discipleship. That's where Jesus got his joy. If you remember when he was serving and the disciples came to feed him and he said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And what he was talking about was that doing spiritual things and serving other people gave him such energy that he didn't even need food. And I really believe that that's still true today. That the spirit of man can be encouraged by the spirit of God and given life and health and vitality when we love others. Again, look at verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. God's will is that we would show that love, that we would be known by that same Christ-like love. To the world, love is weakness. To the world, the name Jesus is powerless. But to those of us that are saved, we are defined by His name. We are called Christians. And we should look like it and walk like it. We should encourage people in the truth. And I find it interesting that He says that if you'll lay down your life for your friends, how many of you would take a bullet for the person sitting next to you? Amen. Amen. How many of you would take a bullet for your neighbor? Yeah, maybe. You must live by your family. <laughs> you must not have my neighbors. I'm just kidding. Amen. Guys, I want to just give you this thought. John was trying to encourage us and tell us that we can have true joy, just as Jesus said. We can rejoice. We can have happiness when we do it God's way. He wants us to be loving. And again, I, I know this isn't a super profound concept or sermon. It's kind of a nuts and bolts thing that we're supposed to be known by love. We're supposed to help each other in love. By love, serve one another. This is what we've been called to do. This is what we should spend our time doing. When we go out and we knock on a stranger's door and we preach the gospel to them, we should do it out of love. 
Dear Heavenly Father, I, I do love you so much. And Lord, I thank you for your words. Lord, I pray that you would use these scriptures in our heart to compel us, to motivate us, to encourage. Lord, I pray that you would help us to find joy in discipling others. I pray that you would help us to be able to rejoice when another brother or sister in Christ grows in the truth. Lord, I ask that you would just have your will today. I pray that you would help us as we go out preaching the gospel. I ask that you would bless the men's preaching night tonight. Lord, help us now as we worship you in song. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.